praise evening? Yes. <laughs> I would have said no less. Yes. Uh, we plan to be very laid back here. We're going to do a dog and pony show. I'm the dog, here's the pony. <laughs> um, Kim Sexton and I, I'm Linda Kuhn, I'm Dean of the Honors College and a medieval historian. Uh, Professor Sexton is a historian of medieval art and architecture. And we've been teaching together for, I don't want to tell you how long. 20 years. 1999. How'd that happen? <laughs> and uh, tonight we're giving a sneak preview of a spring Honors College signature seminar called Gothic. And we're not just going to be playing in the 13th century, we're actually going to take this all the way up to the 21st. So, what we're going to do, I'll just give the structure and then I'm going to hand it over to Professor Sexton. Professor Sexton is going to go over the major topics of the course for the students who might be interested in applying. And then we sort of divided them out. So we're going to pull out a couple of these and we're each going to go intensively on four of them. So you'll see us sort of going back and forth, so don't think it's too weird. <laughs> but we're very happy that you're all here, students. If you're interested in signing up for the Signature Seminar, and I've already got some apps. Actually, I've got apps for all of our courses. The deadline is November 1st, I think, All Saints Day. And if you, need, if you have questions about applying, you can come see me after class. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Sexton, and we're going to get all art history dark on you. Yes, please. <laughs> That's pretty good. It's important that the images pop out at you. Should I, should I shield you all a little better there? It's down, no. not much. It's down? If you want to move, you don't want that sun on you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But it's probably going down. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, I never taught uh, standing at an altar before, so this is a uh, Thank you. It's an honors college. Props. Um, Gothic is a... Uh, is it an idea as well as an artistic style found in art and architecture? Uh, that's a question several, well, several, some historians have tried to answer to try to find, usually starting with the architecture. Um, and there's not so many art movements that begin with buildings rather than painting or sculpture because buildings are so much more expensive than other forms of art. So a lot of times architecture is a follower rather than a leader. Uh, but I think that's not true in the case of Gothic architecture. So when we try to look at uh, reflections of Gothic in culture, we're looking just that to see if it's reflected back. Um, instead of kind of coming out of the culture in a kind of organic way on its own. But what's one of, that's one of the things we want to talk about in this seminar, because while I am an architectural historian, and when I go through these images, you're going to see a lot of buildings, I have to say. I try to find other things to show. <laughs> but there are a lot of things uh, to show you. They are brilliant, you have to say. Although, I realize that the French always have stained glass in their Gothic, but not every country really followed that rule. There are other ways to kind of get brilliance um, into buildings, but somehow we are always coming back to these pictures. So like Linda Kuhn just said, I'm going to go through, be, this will be pretty fast because the, the, what you need to know is kind of written on the slide, uh, which is that topic number one in the course, but not only the course, in the way Gothic starts is with a building of Saint-Denis in Paris. And one of the questions about why such a building would come about in a specific place has to do with uh, theology. So theology and Gothic will be the first unit um, that we cover. Did you notice the Merovingians? I thought you would like that. Yeah. So that's a little bit early medieval for Linda. <laughs> Um, and of course that colored light that's falling on them is coming from stained glass windows. The second topic, which will also be one of mine, uh, is Gothic and theology, uh, Gothic and technology, sorry. So you're looking at the <laughs> flying buttresses of Beauvais Cathedral because without those buttresses, you won't be able to have walls of pure colored glass. So the two things really go hand in hand, technology and theology. Um, so that'll be an important unit always to cover uh, with uh, anything talk, uh, Gothic. 
Um, from there, we'll be moving into Gothic and monarchy. Uh, this is uh, the first few slides, and probably a lot of our early lectures we heavily. Francophilic. Uh, France is pretty important in these early centuries, uh, but we will branch out. So that's Louis the Ninth. He's in the Saint Chapelle, but in the darker lower chapel that a lot of people don't uh, look at uh, when they're considering the chapel. After monarchy, and hand in hand with monarchy, is war uh, and the Crusades. And what you're looking at is now nowhere near, uh, nowhere near France, but in Cairo, and it's a, a, a citadel built by Saladin, the Muslim general who booted the Christian down of Jerusalem. Um, and he, notice, his old gate of his citadel has a Gothic window right, right in the middle, hard to miss. And other Gothic details are in his building. So I'm putting this up uh, because this might not say Crusades exactly. He's the victor in a way, um, and but it's very kind of interesting how fluid um, signs of the Gothic style can become and where they can show up. Right? So what's Gothic about the windows? It's pointed arch, really, right? And then the clover-shaped uh, window inside. So all the way in Jerusalem. And then Gothic and medicine, something that Dakota is very much looking forward to. Mm -hmm. Looking at a beautiful hospital in Bones, that's not the Hospice de Bones, um, in Burgundy, uh, in France. It's moving later, uh, a little bit later in the Middle Ages, uh, but it was built um, as uh, on purpose as a hospital uh, by uh, wealthy donors who uh, wanted to help the, their region after the Hundred Years' War. It's for sick people, for homeless people, and many things like that. So we went, this, isn't, this is how we can shift our attention from Gothic as an architectural style like to Gothic as a kind of cultural um, momentum. And then, right, one of my favorite periods, say the best historical period, <laughs> is the period of the free communes in Italy. So we're talking about the same kind of time period, especially the 13th century, when republics, uh, city-states like Florence, Venice, Milan, Siena, etc., um, essentially governed themselves, mostly free of uh, intervention on the part of the emperors, and they created architecture to go along with their creative governments. Republics may not sound creative to us today, but since at the time, in the 1200s, a little before, there hadn't been a republic since the Roman Republic fell, this was a big deal. Right? Because the form of government that was important was monarchy. And their uh, surroundings are always Gothic. Now it's Italian Gothic, looks different, no stained glass. <laughs> so after that, uh, we kind of skipped the Renaissance, right? Because <laughs> the Renaissance <laughs> brings it back the language of Roman antiquity, and suddenly people realize there's an alternative to what they've been doing, which is Gothic. Gothic was the name of the game and didn't need a name and didn't have a name <coughs> right, until the Renaissance, except they sometimes called it the modern way of building. But once the, once the, the language of antiquity um, inserts itself again, well, listen, Gothic has to call itself in question because there's an alternative that seems as important, maybe more. But when we jump to, I'm sorry, I didn't put the date down here. When we jump to the 18th century, Gothic is back in, a, in its early revival mode. So we'll be looking at Gothic and gender. This is just a country house, uh, but it seems, since Gothic is proposing itself as a kind of third uh, um, style of liberty at this point, it goes well with that. Finally, moving into the 19th century, <coughs> Gothic and modernity. The Houses of Parliament in London. Uh, the old ones burned down. I always tell my students, fire's an architect's friend, right? and they had to rebuild. Um, all other <laughs> houses of uh, like our own capital uh, and our own buildings in this country are built in the classical way, but London, despite being, England, despite being a parliamentary system, decided to go with Gothic. 
It means that Gothic is now like a choice that has political and nationalistic um, um, uh, implications to it. Right? And so it's go looking back, right? but it's looking back at the past in order to understand or try to understand how to deal with the present. And the present is the present of the Industrial Revolution and uh, growing nation states and nationalism. So it's a major trend right in the 19th century, as is then labor, since labor unions and labor strikes are part of 19th century life. Uh, we find that Gothic seems to be, at least sometimes, um, the working man's kind of friend. It doesn't tell you exactly how to do your capitals and how to design your architectural details, like classical architecture has rules, rules, rules. The Gothic didn't seem to. So it seems like a style that's friendly towards people who still work with their hands and are not um, kind of dehumanized uh, by the machine. Uh, and these, by the way, are iron capitals. Uh, here uh, in the Muse Oxford Museum of Natural History, because this is a great example of this, but they're wrought by hand. Not everything, but those capitals. So modern materials, but an older way of working, a less dehumanizing way of working. All right, well, that, <laughs> that and capitalism, United States. Okay. Um, Gothic and capitalism, uh, the skyscraper, then the sky skyscraper. That's always a relevant term, right? So it depends on what buildings are behind you. Right? But at the time, the Woolworth Building, nicknamed Cathedral of Commerce, because uh, it looks a little bit like a cathedral with a strong front tower and high shoulders. Uh, people who were designing these tall buildings kind of looked for uh, guidance in how do you articulate such a tall, massive, iron-based, uh, sorry, steel frame structure. So Gothic was really uh, suggested itself because of its usual verticality right, in cathedrals and things like that. So it came to be used for that. Uh, so this part that you see here, this uh, beautiful um, upper part is right here. So that's just the very crest of the Woolworth Building, which is now full story condos. Yeah, let's talk about the 1%. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Gothic and education will be a, another week. This will also keep us in the United States. Uh, not that there aren't Gothic universities in uh, England, but what we're interested in is the use of collegiate Gothic, and we're in a building now that's collegiate Gothic, um, in the United States, and why it becomes a favored uh, style for universities in the 20th century. And I just have a feeling we won't like everything we find out, <laughs> but we're going to be looking at that. So Yale University, one of the oldest uh, universities in the United States, its original building is this little brick pile here uh, called Connecticut Hall, right, which Thomas Jefferson would certainly say, as he said of other university buildings, William and Mary, he said, <laughs> ugly and misshapen piles, but that they had roots would be taken for brick kilns. <laughs> so that's our kind of history of the university. But what's next to it, what everybody thinks who's been to New Haven and seen the beautiful campus of Yale, is that essentially it's another Cambridge. And it does have some of the best um, neo or Gothic, collegiate Gothic architecture. I mean, they acid stained the roof uh, slates so they would look old. They changed the windows so they would have cracked everything. No expense here. Uh, Gothic in nature. Trees are going to be an important part of the um, Gothic language, even when they're made of stone. But in this case, this is a kind of postmodern uh, landscape art take on the Amiens Cathedral in France, but it's in the Netherlands. It's very cool. It's made to measure to the Amiens Cathedral, except for the height. Um, and then if you notice, there's a patch out here where the trees are going to grow up around it and create the kind of outdoor room. I know, isn't that awesome? I see your faces. Like, you know, it's like, this is more fascinating than the stained glass. Yeah. <laughs> and then last, uh, Gothic in the 21st century, that was brought all home to us um, in April this year. 
And we were teaching H2P together. Um, in fact, as you pointed out, our Gothic papers were due on that day. Um, and uh, so we will be uh, ending the class with talking about the future of Gothic, and, and of course about the, some of the controversies that went along, uh, are still going on, about how it should be restored, um, who should pay for it, what it should look like, and all those things. Wrong year. Sorry? Wrong year. Is it? Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. <laughs> Thank you. So let me say, at least check the time here, because I like I think I went longer than I should have. Oh, so I thought I had more. Okay, so um, I'll just say uh, I'm going to talk about theology and technology, and then I'm going to hand it over to Dean Kuhn, and she'll talk about a few things. And maybe then, if there's time, we'll we'll continue with the modern things after. So as I said, we would start with theology. And you know, theology's been around; it doesn't need architecture to exist. Most of the uh, major religions today often will say, like, um, we don't need buildings, or the people are our church or our temple, but then they all will get done, right? and usually very nice ones. <laughs> right? So theology has always been, uh, always happens, and it really no matter what the building looks like. In the case of Gothic, it's been you know, attributed through uh, theology of light, which is just an old idea, kind of getting new press in the 1140s, led by Abbot Sujay, who's the abbot of this uh, Abbey Sandini, which is the ugliest exterior of a church, or the, one of the most beautiful interiors of the church. It's not its fault, exactly. It's the French Revolution and bad restoration uh, left it like that. Uh, but what we'll be looking at and examining is whether this theology of life, which is simply that things that are material, like fancy stained glass and expensive altar pieces, which you can see that Abbot Sujay really likes, because he's fondling one right there in the stained glass, right? that if you have these things and you contemplate them, we're talking about religious objects, right? and you contemplate them, it can lead you to think of immaterial things, um, such as your soul and your salvation. And that's at least what Abbot Sujay has suggested in his writings, which we will read. Uh, where he's trying to kind of justify all the money he did spend uh, on the church. Right? And so from that, people have said, well, you know, he maybe told his architects, I'm looking for a new kind of building that's going to say this. It's going to say that light is pure, and while it may start in a material thing like colored glass, it leads to other immaterial benefits. But there are other ideas, so we're going to introduce them, but I don't want to take up uh, most uh, too much. And then to make this work, right, you need the technology of right, the flying buttresses, right, <coughs> special lightweight vaults in the ceiling called rib vaults, um, and pointed arches. All that stuff has to work together. Um, and so the two have to go hand in hand. And so what we're going to focus on in the technology unit is well, you know, how this works. We generally know how it works. But we'll be looking at how things fail. So Notre Dame is an example of a, it's a kind of a mess, honestly. Right? Nobody's really crying over it because it was a masterpiece of Gothic. Sorry to inform you. Wasn't. Right? But it's a great kind of, what did I call it again? Workshop of errors. Yeah, workshop of errors. Right? So it starts in 1155, and they're redoing it again already in the 1220s. Yes, they're making it up better, uh, but it's a big transformation. So, and this unit will be, this is what it, they were starting with, and it seemed okay, until it wasn't. Right? And then they decided, more light, should we do our buttresses this way? No, we better do them that way. Um, things that they hadn't thought about, like the effect of wind on a tall, thin building, no one had to think about that before. But now it became obvious that they needed to. So we'll be looking, and don't be too intimidated by drawings. Um, they are there. And the, the end result on the outside is, you know, pretty nice. I've always admired how Notre Dame looks from the back and the front, honestly. Uh, there are different ways people have approached this. Um, Old-fashioned, like this is the 1980s, this is hilarious. Uh, photoelastic models, super slow and expensive. And then now we have digital scanning, so it's like nobody cares about that. Sometimes we're trying to understand how the building stood up, or when they fell down, why did they fall down? 
And but often, people are just trying to understand uh, how can we keep them standing up. Uh, so this uh, digital scanning of Amiens in vitro, people are very nervous. They see increasing size of cracks in the, in the building. And so it's constantly being monitored right, that the cracks aren't getting any bigger and what should people do. <coughs> Sometimes that's because there's too much traffic around the building, um, buses rumbling around. Uh, of course, they don't allow that anymore. But um, you know, there's nothing saying that it's going to stand forever, So just because it has been for 800 years. OK, now I get to turn this over to you and I get to get a drink of water. <laughs> a hard story for me to tell in two minutes, but it's one of my favorite stories, and it's a story that was brought to us by the best medievalist who ever lived, and that was largely in the 1930s. One was Mark Block, and the other was Ernst Kintorowitz. So I'd like to just say a, a moment of silence for them, and I'm going to use them a little bit in what I'm about to say. Uh, Capetian Paris and Capetian France in the 13th century was creating the city of Paris as a kind of international capital. And its style became the signature style of the kings of France of this dynasty called Capetian. And this part, this is a, a great medieval model of what Paris looked like. And you'll see you've got three very important sacred points. At the top is the Abbey of Saint-Denis, which Professor Sexton just mentioned its associations with the origins of the Gothic. And then you have what becomes a royal bureaucratic center here on this little island. And this, this is the Louis IX's great chapel reliquary that I'm going to mention in a minute. And then, of course, the more famous one for Americans is Notre Dame right here. So again, we have a monastic abbey church, we have an Episcopal cathedral, and we have a royal chapel, which has some resonance in Charlemagne's world mm -hmm. with the chapel at Aachen. So I'm going to come back to this map in a minute. <laughs> I, what, what are you going to say? I had Russell Cothran with me, a professional photographer. This is one of the hardest buildings from the medieval period to get a great photograph of because of its massive walls of windows. I mean, it's overwhelming when you come into the building for the first time. But it was built as a reliquary. The entire building to frame relics of the passion, especially the crown of thorns, which Louis IX, the Capetian genius, purchased from the Byzantine Empire at a sum that was more expensive than actually building the chapel. Interesting medieval economics. <laughs> and so when Louis IX greeted, he went out, actually out to the outskirts of Paris in this big ceremony and he greeted the relic as a kind of imperial parade going into the city, and he raised it up over his head. He didn't put it on his head. Even he was not quite that crazy. <laughs> this was a huge moment in the history of the French monarchy, and it's a wonderful story. Louis IX became king at the age of 12. His mother ruled as regent, Blanche of Castile. I wouldn't mess with her. He was a crusader. He was the Solomon of France, the great justice giver. And like Mark Bloch's old Merovingian kings, he had the royal touch. He was one of those kings, in fact, the last of his species, who could heal by touching people. After his death, he worked 64 miracles, and they affected every, every part of the social and economic fabric of France. And that's super calculated in a miraculous kind of way. <laughs> oh my god, the story is unbelievable. The great crusader, who, who does a, two terrible crusades, actually, well, I shouldn't say great, it was kind of a failure. <laughs> First in Egypt, and you saw Salah Dean's uh, lovely palace there. And then secondly, in what is modern day Tunisia, where he died on the crusade of dysentery. And when he died, they actually melted his body. They boiled all the flesh <laughs> off, and they took parts and in fact, I'm going to spread the parts around my map. This is so beautiful, and I don't have time, I know. You'll, you'll stop me at some point, I'm sure. OK, Saint Chapelle got his head, but not with the jaws and the teeth and the chin. Mostly, 
the body, the sacred body, went to Saint Denis because that is the burial place of French kings, going back to the Merovingian period. That's the, those are my people. And then uh, a rib. This is really great. One of his ribs went to Notre Dame. So notice the, the tension is still going on here. They're, you know, they're not fighting over his relics, but Saint Denis is still super important, and it has this sort of fundamental piece of the king. But for the pagans among you, I always think of the Capitoline Hill, right, with the skull on Jupiter's under his temple. Now we have the caput, right? We have the head of the Capetian world, and his head, minus chin, jaws, and teeth, is actually ensconced in Saint Chapelle. There he is. I mentioned he's the great justice giver, according to his biographers. He always sat under an oak tree and dispensed justice to all different classes on the model of Solomon. And in fact, when you go to Saint Chapelle, there's a lot of Solomonic imagery all in the building. And that has to do with, of course, Louis the Ninth. The other side I mentioned is Louis was a crusader, albeit not a very successful one. Again, he fought a crusade in Egypt, and he fought a crusade in North Africa, <laughs> the Roman province of Byzacana. And the other thing that's very interesting about Saint Chapelle is kind of in addition to being a reliquary building, it's a jeweled reliquary for the relics of the Passion and eventually parts of Louis' head. Um, it's also super violent building. Now, most people, when they go in this, look at the beautiful colors, is that right? It's kind of hard to read these, unless you have an expert with you. Plus, they're hard to see, they're way up there. <laughs> but this is an incredibly violent building, and in ways that I think most of us would find very offensive, even though it is the great building of France. So, Old Testament imagery is deployed militantly. The Israelites against their idolatrous enemies, and now Islam, right? The whole the subtext of Saint Chapelle is a fight against Islam. And the, uh, the stained glass tells the story using, of course, as you can see here, very chivalric kind of characters. Oops, is this not working? Oh, well. Chivalric French characters in the place of the battling Israelites. So there's a lot of stuff to look at. And of course, the, I think exactly as Professor Sexton was saying, the thing about the Gothic, under the Capetians, it becomes the international style. Everybody wants it, and it goes back both back ways. That is, the French are not beyond, and of course also in Spain, quoting from what they considered Islamic architectural styles. And you'll see this in the Gothic too, sometimes as sort of a trophy of their Christian imperialism. So there is this sort of inter interesting international style through the Gothic that works both ways. Now, I am very excited about this. I'm actually going to make the case, and act, you know, this is the beauty of being a med medievalist. If I'm wrong, no one can say I am, because who knows? <laughs> I'm so sorry for my modernist colleagues. <laughs> but the 13th century is so amazing. It actually is the great century of dissections. Not your people. <laughs> 13th century is the time period when medical schools start to flourish, especially in Italy first, and gradually making their way up to Paris. And we have a whole series of manuscripts that are actually anatomical treaties. We have a doctor in Bologna, of course, performing autopsies in the 13th century with students. We have everything that the early modern period claims for itself being enacted in the Middle Ages. But these medieval doctors had a lot of problems. First and foremost, they had Christ. And Christ in the Middle Ages is often described as a medicus, the chief physician who had the ultimate healing power. But it's my old Carolingian people in the ninth century that started to create the identity of a doctor as a good Christian professional. And so you can see the origins. I don't have time to talk about that, but it's really awesome. There are actually 75 medical, medical manuscripts from the Carolingian period that basically haven't even been read. Because the stereotype of dark age medicine is, it's not there. Well, guess what? It is if you look for it. So too at the 13th century, right? We have all kinds of anatomical treaties and diagrams. Again, the Italians are really central in this. 
and there is some Islamic influence, which we can talk about in the class. But also, we start to see more and more of this kind of thing, teaching texts with bodies, because they're actually dissecting bodies. What the stereotype is, Christians didn't do that, because that was somehow unlawful. That is not true. Who loves dead bodies more than medieval Christians? <laughs> no one. Who chops them up and spreads them everywhere? <laughs> right? Who's already looking into the bodies of humans through the cult of saints? So I'm going to argue the culture of medicine has a lot to do with relics. And the fact that you already have this Christian culture of inspecting God's creation through human anatomy as a good thing. That's there in the Middle Ages, even though you're always told it's not. And I give you this example as one. You have this great visitation scene of Mary and Elizabeth, and they have wombs, which are crystals. And the, the, the pious are asked to look into their wombs. We have a great essay on this by Catherine Park. It's called Unlocking Women's Secrets in the Middle Ages. All of this predates the Renaissance. All of it is about medieval Christians being interested in the inner workings of the human body. And they collect skulls. <laughs> they chop up bodies like Louis the Ninth. They hold dissection classes in what's basically a medieval classroom. That is all going on. So how does that relate to the Gothic? Here we go. I'm going to say the, the Gothic building is a very much a striptease artist. The Gothic building loves to show you its anatomy, much more so than the Romanesque or the Roman. Its skeleton, its sinews, its muscles, we're going to dissect it in the context of looking at the history of medicine. Because I actually think that this is a triangulation, right? Building, body, and science. It's super fascinating. There's not a lot written on it, it's a lot brighter. And oh my god, Professor Sexton is right. I do love the 13th century. The Italians are so awesome in this time period. <laughs> this is one of the greatest stories in Western history, <clears throat> the rise of the Italian commune. The attempt by middling economic classes to seize power from bishops, kings, and the nobility at large. It is a war that's fought over two centuries. And it ends up, for those of you that are good leftists, well, you still won't like the outcome, but it's the Middle Ages. You have, eventually, you have a bureaucracy in these cities that's comprised <laughs> of middling to upper middling classes. And in some cases, like the history of Florence, you actually see wool workers take over the government for a while. You have some really radical moments in the 14th century. Right? This is a great story in the social and economic history of Europe. But citizens start to run their own republics. And they did this by chipping away all those old feudal systems and by forcing the nobility to move into cities. Hence, when you go to an Italian town, you'll see all these towers that are sticking up everywhere. Those should be in the countryside. But in this time period, they're brought in by the bourgeoisie. I love it. It's one of the great stories of human history. And unlike the church, so you're looking out at a civic building here from the loggia of a church. And the fountain in the middle, it's really the citizens in the republic that start to take over the duty of feeding, watering, and caring for people. And that's all over a lot of this artwork. And of course, you cannot do this subject without looking at a series of very famous frescoes from Siena, a whole series of good government looks like this. Bad government. We should have given you bad government because it's much more fun than good government. But here you see the up at the top, this figure up here. See the male figure with the beard? That's the sort of the embodiment of the commune and all of its social classes. And then you have all the citizens. And as Professor Sexton pointed out to me, they're tied together by a rope. No, they're holding on to a yeah, rope. They're holding on to a rope, not tied. So they're marching along here, and you have this super ordinary or um, orderly system of government run by non-nobles, which, by the way, at times could be massively violent. Gothic was the style. Part of that was, screw you, Roman antiquity. Sorry, Charlie. Um, <laughs> the resistance where the, uh, the, the sort of local style was considered to be the modern style, was considered to be resistant to some of the things that they were trying to break free of. And I know I've probably gone on too long. So I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. We're going to skip a few centuries, but, you know, 
at least in England, people have figured that there's probably only about a decade in the 18th century when nothing Gothic is being built, like nothing is finished or being started. So here, <coughs> Kuhn and I are going to get modern by going to, oh, okay, I don't want to, okay, good, I don't want to hear you. Ah. And we, for some reason, can't get rid of the, um, oh wait, yes, we can. So this building is Strawberry Hill, and we're going to queer Gothic now for you. We said gender, but that's not really what we mean. Okay. Um, because some of the people have looked at Strawberry Hill and its owner, Horace Walpole, um, and his committee of taste, as he called them, two other guys and himself, who built what might has been called a large Gothic closet, or something in the high camp defiance of normal convention. Because at the time that Strawberry Hill was built, uh, Horace Walpole's daddy uh, built a neo palladian building, so very classical and, and stern. And right outside of London, his son and his friends seem to have decided that they needed something that represented a kind of liberty of taste a great deal more. And so they built a Gothic villa, neo-Gothic villa. It's the earliest neo-Gothic building. Uh, that is there, and it's been recently restored, um, just in the last, just reopened in 2000, 2009. So what we're interested in, Gothic now, since classical architecture had been in for a century in most of, most of Europe, Gothic now is like asserting itself as the other uh, style, along with other exotic styles like uh, Chinese styles or chinoiserie. And it's hardly criticized when the building opened. I mean, people flock to see it, just like tourists go to see it today. But it's decried for representing kind of degeneracy um, of taste, right? A very foppish kind of building. But uh, so we're going to be looking at it in that way. For a lot of history, I would say really up until you know um, the 1990s, uh, people looked at the building and tried to figure out uh, which, uh, which other Gothic buildings, real Gothic buildings, it was referencing. Uh, from time to time. And we probably are not going to play that game in our class. So there's nothing uh, wrong with that, and maybe with it a little. Uh, but we want to look at it in a different way. Uh, when newer ideas of sexuality uh, in the 18th century are coming in. So that will be that. And beyond that, we'll move forward, as we said, to Gothic and modernity. I had mentioned how things like the Industrial Revolution made people kind of think with history. And Gothic was a constant touchstone. I mean, classical architecture had always been there, and neoclassical architecture um, coming as a kind of standard. But Gothic is something that several old people, especially in England, um, use. Um, Augustus Pugin is one of the earliest. He's a Roman Catholic. Um, Catholics had just been emancipated in England in, I think, the 1830s. I don't remember that date exactly. Um, and so he was a big leader in this. And he did you know, amazing things, like taking uh, the fact that you could build uh, an entire environment, an entire city in the Gothic style, it would be a cure for modernity's problems. And it was a little naive sounding, although it's not quite as naive as that. But he published a book called Contrast, when he just set out <coughs> the, the same scene in 1440 and today. Yeah, like that. So, Today, we have a, a, a classical parish church. And you notice someone's like, nobody's there. Someone's fighting in the streets. <laughs> Just not working. But the Gothic parish church, that's what it would be called. They're streaming in. Right? Now, he chooses 1440 for a reason, because he's Catholic, as I mentioned. And he's not going to choose anything from the period of Henry VIII. Henry VIII forward is when the perpendicular Gothic, which is English's, England's kind of signature style, is about. So we're going to be looking at him, but also then at, at Eugène Viollet le Duc, a Frenchman, uh, who um, was also instrumental in looking at Gothic for ideas about how to deal with modernity in a much different way. Uh, he is someone as a young man, a very young man, over in that uh, um, painting watercolor he did of himself. Uh, who studies Gothic architecture because he admires the structure. He thinks that because its structure is so liberated from previous ideas, and it was. I mean, people were essentially designing your Gothic cathedrals based on empirical experience, 
They didn't yet know how to like calculate stresses and loads and stuff like that that we teach students now. So everything had been experimental. So he's thinking that like the, the way that people approach things, finding things out for themselves was the way to do the modern thing and that Gothic was a model for that. So you weren't supposed to copy what it looked like. You were supposed to like follow the principles it was based on. And so uh, that's what he did. So he, he looked closely at structures and then he translated them into modern materials like iron. And then he came up with some really wacky and ugly looking face, which nobody built, right? But it was just like the idea right, that he could like combine masonry and iron. He's probably most famous for his restorations and how he learned all these things, like how Gothic was, uh, what parts it was made of, which was by being up close and personal. And at the age of only 30, uh, he became uh, the uh, restorer in chief at Notre Dame Cathedral, which had been neglected since the French Revolution. There's a picture of it in 1840, and just in 1843 when he is proposing as uh, a restoration. And I want to point out like something he's going to add, which is that spire right there. You see very faintly in the back. Now, he didn't create this out of thin air. They had had one, and in the 1780s, it had been uh, taken down because it was dangerous. So he wasn't recreating things. But it's that, sp uh, sorry, sorry. It's that spire, of course, uh, that fell down uh, in April. This is made of wood uh, with uh, exterior parts of lead. But that was his design. Um, and I don't think he was copying anything in particular, uh, but just based on ideas that he had seen uh, in other places. So he said he is an, and he was right about Gothic pointing the way to future architecture for modern architecture. Um, it would leave uh, the classical architecture behind. Right. So in this unit, finally, frequently asked questions indeed right, um, about what to do with uh, Notre Dame and how it should be handled. We'll probably end our class um, with a week on this, uh, on this issue. And anyone who has time to spend Googling can find out that there are already many different proposals for how to replace the roof of Notre Dame. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I think that one with a stained glass roof is actually that bad. I mean, I wouldn't do it all in a pattern, but I would like, I, I would think, because uh, it looks too much like a rug. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, all kinds of things. This one over here is supposed to be a clear glass. It just looks like it's blue right here. But Kuhn and I were talking. We thought that looked like a department store. You know how those department stores have restaurants on their roofs? It kind of looks like that. This is pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so these are these are proposals, which are always fun to talk about. Right? What should be done, what should be done. Uh, we want to just uh, conclude with a little bit of a teaser for our class, which uh, we would like to include a field trip um, right the weekend. Uh, spring break starts on March 23rd, so that's a Monday. And so we'd like to um, make a field trip to our uh, one of the nearby, <coughs> relatively, and with excellent neo-Gothic architecture, a Gothic Chicago trip. University of Chicago's main quad is neo-Gothic from the 1890s. It's a wonderful um, Gothic chapel. This is uh, the Rockefeller Chapel at University of Chicago. It's about as close as you're going to get to something like King's College Chapel in Cambridge. Um, it is all stone masonry, no steel, which is like a big deal right, in, the, in the 20th century. Although it does have a big concrete foundation. But it's a real, you know, it's really carved off part. Uh, while we're at the University of Chicago, we cannot not see Frank Lloyd Wright. I, I cannot take students and like not show them. Probably America's most famous house, and we'd be second to Monticello, but still. And I think we can Gothicize it, don't you? I mean, look at that. Yeah, look at that stained glass and the, and the frame and the light coming out. I think we can totally do that. Um, but uh, other things we'll see: uh, the First United Methodist Church was up in the first skyscraper church in the United States. I love. You have to love Americans just like. Why not? So notice that advertisement here. It tells you, here's our skyscraper. It was the tallest church in the country, probably the world. Your sanctuary. Here's where your priest lives up there. Pretty nice. Um, then your chimes. Then the sky chapel. There's like three churches in the building. We can see them all. Right? And that's the sky chapel. Isn't that amazing? So it's this octagonal. Look at these. Like, Steel struts coming down. 
and then like holding the altar. Awesome. I've got a book. Uh, and then uh, the last thing, I'm mean, not the last thing we see, but the last thing I'm going to show you right, is the uh, Tribune building, Chicago, the Chicago Tribune, the newspaper, right here with all the colored lights on it. Um, a neo Gothic skyscraper from the 1920s, um, which I'm sure we can tour. Uh, it looks like they've taken a kind of Gothic apse and just made it kind of go around eight sides to crown this building which is all in Gothic detail going all the way up. So we're not going to go to New York and see the Cathedral of Commerce, but this is pretty good. <laughs> Chicago architecture rules. Um, and this looks like a pretty awesome thing to see. Um, so many of our themes that we can touch on, I mean, there's other things to see, of course, uh, but it's nice to know um, the 20th century things that um, our big cities have right, for us. OK, I think that's all. Okay. We're happy to entertain questions. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering how the this all relates to uh, Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Well, that's a good question. So Sagrada Familia, um, it looks very Gothic, and in fact, the the character of Barcelona Gothic in the Middle Ages is rather unique. And if you look at it, kind of anticipates what's coming. But cool things about it. Uh, it's all kind of handmade. Arches are a new kind of arch called a hyperbolic arch. Well, it's not new, but it's new, new, newly used in the 20th century. Um, also, no steel. Um, and something that's created for and new for the modern era. And so, so many things are like, uh, like it. I mean, now it has like steel and concrete because they've decided to finish it. Finish it with steel. Yeah, yeah it's really too bad. Yeah, and you I can tell a mile that. away. Yeah. You know? yeah. But all right. Uh, you can still see the good stuff too. So, um, yeah, that's a, so that's an uh, important uh, kind of turn of events. It fits with this 1920s and early 20th century interest in, interesting Gothic, but looks nothing like the <coughs> nothing like the books. Are see, that's how just like how varied approaches can be. So are you only going to show the good aspects of the Gothic Revival, or are we going to see <laughs> some of the horror shows, too? Uh, horror shows. Like St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, we should. I mean, right, we should definitely see that stuff. Uh, the things that are, you know. I think part of the reason that Pugin was so interested in going back to the way that they did it in the medieval period with, like, stone and stone masons and things like that is because people are already cranking out, like, iron churches galore, right, to, to fill... Uh, filled the need in burgeoning cities with working populations, and he was kind of horrified by what was being stamped out. Oh, you know, and another thing that I, I want to do in this, I guess we'll have to expand this part, but is a colonial Gothic, like what England built out in Africa and, and even Australia, because that is very interesting, how they used it as a kind of civilizing mission. So, yeah, so, yeah, definitely do bad things. Yeah. <laughs> of doing the Gothic preservations and making sure that these buildings last for as long as they possibly can? What's the purpose? Oh, I guess, um, you know, I think it's, it's really important because we couldn't, we really can't, don't know how to build them anymore. And so I think that, uh, like most, well, like once buildings get a certain age, like there's a real interest in having them be around. Um, got, buildings that are more at risk are the ones that were just built 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, which, of course, we'd all be crying uh, 100 years from now that we didn't care about them and we just let them be wiped away, right? which has happened several times in the United States, in Chicago especially. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess at a certain point, things are like a certain age. People just think, like, well, we got to hold on to this. Right? And I think also because, like I said, we couldn't, we don't know how to build, as we will find out in Paris, right? how nobody can carve anymore, how you're going to get a machine to do this, and all of those um, s skills that we lost <coughs> over the years, right. uh, especially starting in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? Didn't Craig Jones call Georgetown Chapel, Chapel um, Ozark Gothic or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he named it after Saint Chapel, the mm -hmm. reliquary, the uh, yeah. crown of thorns relic. Yeah, he was blown away by the building. It, it, is it very much looks, uh, you know, 
Although it has none of the like details of Gothic design uh, ornament, yeah. But it's you know it's glass walls and it's held up right by that intersecting part, so nothing is pushing it from the sides, but it's pulled together from those joints. It's it's genius, right? It's really um, you know it, like, this step forward that I really don't know anybody has tried to do anything like that and still feels like it has echo so much of this older style. All right, well, thanks for coming, and uh, we're happy to have you.